Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, fortunately, when I looked at my notes from last year, I, I mean, I was like, how, what am I going to do? Because I didn't get to any of the stuff I was meant to talk about last time. But I realized the same thing happened last time, last year. <laughs> <laughs> so I already had notes based on the idea that I didn't get to anything. <laughs> Obviously, I should go back and analyze more carefully what happens in these lectures. <laughs> Plan better for the future, but oh well. Anyway, so um, so I'm going to start by talking. Well, so I start by talking by talking about the classification of complex ideas. I mean. This, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but there's something that's a little confusing about it, right? So there's ideas in general, and they're divided into simple and complex. And then complex ideas are separated into substance or ideas of substance. Um, sometimes he says one and sometimes he says the other. Modes and relations. Um, now, um, um, I guess I should have written them in a different order, I'm like the order he actually talks about them in, and the, or therefore the order we're going to talk about them in. We're you know first talking about modes. So like I will, I don't want to get too much at the moment into the question, especially explaining what ideas of substance are and how they're different from modes. But like the basic difference is supposed to be that the idea of a substance is the idea of something that has certain qualities, something that has certain qualities, right? So like an example of an idea of substance is the idea of force. That's a general abstract idea of substance. Because a horse is not just a list of properties, but it's something that has those properties. So it's like a subject in which they mirror. Whereas a mode is just like a list of properties. So. Um, so an example of mo of a mode is that uh, Locke gives sometimes is drunkenness. Um, right. So like drunkenness is a list of properties that that a, an animal could have, a human being, I guess, could have. Um, it's not a kind of thing. Now, I mean, like in principle, I said I wasn't going to get into this too much. In principle, you could have the same list of qualities being used to make the idea of a substance and being used as a mode, right? Like kind of like hoarseness, the idea of hoarseness versus the idea of horse. But in practice, although I think Locke doesn't, I don't think it's a place where Locke clearly explains this, but you can tell from his examples, I think, that um, which kind of these ideas we form, you know, depends on the purpose that we got in mind, or something like that. So it's um, um, we don't usually have like competing ideas. One is the idea of, a, or we don't usually use for very much competing ideas where one is the idea of substance and the other is a mode. Um, but so um, we'll talk about that more when we get to talking about ideas of substances. At the moment, I, I just, because I'm gonna start by talking about simple modes. Um, so there are two kinds of modes, simple modes and um, What is it called the other one? Mix. Mixed thing. I always want to write complex here because mm -hmm. complex is usually the opposite of simple, but that would be wrong. <laughs> and um, and the thing 
thing I want to emphasize here before I start talking about simple modes is that, as you can see, a simple mode is a complex idea. Simple modes are a kind of complex idea. They're not simple ideas. So uh, simple means one means one thing here and means something else here. So um, all right. So what is a simple mode? Well, um, so here's the definition. This is book two, chapter 12, section five on page 160. There's, this is where he's talking about the two kinds of modes. There are some which are only variations or different combinations of the same simple idea. Let me look at the camera here. Um, there are some that are only variations or different combinations of the same simple idea without the mixture of any other as a dozen or score, which are nothing but the ideas of so many distinct units added together. And these I call simple modes as being contained within the bounds of one simple idea. So at least some kind of, at least some simple modes are like this. Um, I want to find form the idea of more things, like an idea of something bigger, there's more of. And the way I do that is by forming a bigger idea. I, so I take the idea of an unit, as he often says, or unity. And I like somehow repeat it. Um, so this might be the idea of three, or I mean, it would be the idea of three. Yeah, to form the idea of three, I take my idea of units and I like repeat it. Um, And this seems to be the same as the operation of enlargements that he talked about in chapter um, 11. Uh, book two, chapter 11, section six on page 154. When he, when remember he talks about compounding or composition and I was spending a lot of time talking about what that means or why we need to do it last time. So at the end of that paragraph, he says, under this of composition may be reckoned also that of enlarging, wherein through the, the composition does not so much appear as in more complex ones, Yet it is nevertheless a putting several ideas together, though of the same kind. Thus, by adding several units together, we make the idea of a dozen. And putting together the repeated ideas of several perches, we frame that of a furlong. <laughs> yes. So is the entire, like, the, is three itself a simple mode, or is the unit a simple mode? No, so the unit is a simple idea. That's, again, oh, I already erased this, but remember, Simple ideas, complex ideas, and under that we have modes, and under that we have simple modes. And, and the definition we just gave of simple modes is that the same simple idea is that there are variations or combinations of the same simple idea. Okay. Right? So the idea of a unit is a simple idea. It's one of those simple ideas that we get from both sensation and reflection. And in fact, that come together with every idea, simple or complex. Um, so it, this is a simple idea, but the idea of three is a simple mode. Yeah. Does that mean, is there like a complex idea then also associated with? 
three, like does the simple idea become a complex idea and then a mode, or is there just no real hierarchy? Well, no, so again, a simple mode is a kind of complex idea. So the idea of three is a complex idea. Okay. Right. So like it's different from a mixed mode, right? Like a like drunkenness, right? Contains many different ideas. Right. Yeah. I don't know exactly what the definition of drunkenness is, but anyway, you can it clearly contains many different ideas. Um, that's a mixed mode. A simple mode is not a simple idea. It's composed, but it's composed out of the same simple idea. Um, now, um, there's already things that are hard to understand about this, um, like what this repetition is, like what is this space where we put them next to each other, right? Like, I mean, if these are all the exact same simple idea, then why isn't there just one of them? Is that the same? <laughs> Um, so, like, um, I'm not sure that this story is completely straightforward, but I want to, um, like, take this as a given and ask how it applies to the case of continuous quantity. Um, because, uh, right, so it's going to turn out the simple modes are, well, these are not the only simple modes, actually, um, but these are the important simple modes. The important simple modes are the ideas of space, time, and number. So this is the number case. No. So in the number case, we repeat the unit over and over. Um, but what about the space case? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so remember, Locke mentioned that in that same paragraph about enlarging. Yeah. Uh, I'm just kind of confused. So the repetition of unity, is that for the space is for mixed modes or simple modes? This is a simple mode. The idea of three is a simple mode. Right, that's why I drew a line to this, which is under simple modes. Here are the simple modes, and ideas of number are simple modes. And again, they're simple modes because it's easiest to understand in this case. They're simple modes because the only simple idea they contain is the unit, the idea of unity. So again, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't like this obviously was not a great terminological choice on Locke's part. I don't know why he did this. <laughs> it's 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 definitely confusing that that a, a simple modes are a kind of complex idea. We might have a whole word complex thing. Um so um, but that's you know, that's what he decided to do, so we have to live with it. Um Right. So but what I wanted to ask is about, so like in that in that paragraph about enlarging in chapter 11, the two examples were um, a dozen. So I think he used, he likes to use these examples like dozen and score, where we have, or pair also sometimes he uses, where we have a special word for um like a special name just for that number of things <laughs> it makes it clearer than an example or he thinks it makes it clearer than an example like three but it's supposed to apply to any number i mean you know here's another question about this what do you, so how do you form the idea of a million by repeating the unit a million times like so you have a big idea in your mind that has the unit in it a million times and that's how you think of a million <laughs> that doesn't sound exactly right. Yeah. Um, would it be well if you did that, but instead you thought of like 10, 100,000, would that be complex then? Or I guess, um, um, would that be a mixed mode? Yeah. yeah. So it seems like the answer is no. And it seems like he does understand that, you, that, that, you're, that that's, you do something like that, but he doesn't talk about it very much. <laughs> um, you know, you're reminding me that I wanted to wear a mask. But 
Oh, well. Everyone's more than six feet away from me, right? <laughs> Too late now, right? All the air inside the mask. Is all <laughs> Whatever. Um, so, um, right. So, but besides a dozen, the other example here was that by repeated, I, but, by, and putting together the repeated ideas of several perches, we frame that of a furlong. So these are like antiquated le oh. le uh, length measures that we don't use anymore. I did look up at some point. There's actually quite a few perches in a furlong, maybe like 70 or something. But if I'm remembering that correctly. But anyway, the point is like it's, you could say, you know, by repeating. Instead of by repeating the idea of unit, we form the idea of three. We say by repeating the idea of foot, we form the idea of yard. Right? So the idea of a yard is so, like, again, to form the idea of something longer, you form a longer idea. <laughs> um, that's. That, that's the way of looking at this, which is kind of surprising if you think about it. Um, although it does, um, um, it does fit into what I've been claiming about resemblance of primary qualities to their ideas. Right, like this kind of structure that this idea has is somehow analogous to something in the object. Yeah. Could an atom be considered a single unit? An atom? Right. Like like the actual like very big part of still like any particular object, right? Like would that could that be theoretically considered a unity that is like a company? Like it, like say water, for instance, is a combination of two right hydrogen well, atoms. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying, like would that would that so, I mean, there's a bunch of things going on here in that question. I mean, so first of all, obviously, an atom is um, um, it's not an idea. It's a, well, from Locke's, it's not an idea. It's not body, right? What we call, as I said before, what we call atoms are not really bodies. You know, there's something weird. But, um, but uh, what Locke would say it's a very small body. So it's not an idea, right? But I think what you're asking is something like, um, when we form the idea of a filled extension, do we do it by repeating the idea of the smallest possible filled extension right. over and over again? And you can ask that also about an empty extension. Right, like, or that is, or when we're abstracting from whether it's filled or not, is probably the best way to look at it. We form an idea of a yard. It's not the idea of a body that's a yard long. It's just that length, right? But again, you can ask the same question. So, like here, we repeated repeated the idea of a foot to get a yard. But isn't the idea of a foot also a simple mode of space? And the answer is yes. So, like. Um, so it's it's not yet similar to this case, where in this case, the idea of unity is completely simple. In fact, Locke says uh, at the beginning of the chapter about number that it's the simplest idea, which I don't understand because an idea is either simple or it's not. But <laughs> somehow it says it's simpler than other ideas. I don't know. But, um, but, but in any case, it's definitely a simple idea. But, and so we understand how if you want the idea of three, all you need is that simple idea of unity and you repeat it three times and you have the idea of three. But, um, but here, like this isn't at all similar because this isn't a simple idea. What's the simple idea? And so if you think that space is, um, that any space is divisible into a finite number of parts, then you could make this work, right? So, so then indeed, what you would be starting with, at least like as in the case of the hundred thousands or whatever, right? Like 
maybe you form the idea of yard by adding together foots or feet. <laughs> and, you, and you form the idea of, of a foot by adding together inches and so on and so forth. But at the bottom, there's the simple idea of a unit of space. Right, and an atom would be a body that occupies a unit of space. Yeah. Right. Um, again, not like this is not really connected to what we call atoms yeah. at all, but it's like connected to what the ancient atomists call atoms. <laughs> um, things so small that they can't be divided. So, um, so we'll see that. Um, Um, Barclay and Hume take exactly that point of view. And they say that Locke um, should have to agree with them because how else can you understand them? But Locke doesn't agree. Right? So Locke thinks we can't form the idea of a smallest space any more than we can form the idea of a largest space. So what's really going on here? And I think, I mean, as far as textual interpretation, if you go back to that paragraph in chapter 12, and I'm certainly not the first one to notice this. Um, there are some which are only variations or different combinations of the same simple idea. So like that or, this is a question that comes up a lot in trying to understand the philosophical text. I think it's already come up before in this class. Variations or combinations. Is this the or, the epexegetical or that means, so it means variations, that is combinations. Or is it the either or or? <laughs> so there's two different possibilities here, either variations or combinations. And so um, it seems like uh, the answer must be the second. It, there's more than one way of forming a simple mode. This is one way of forming simple mode by combining the same simple idea over and over again. But, um, and you can do that with ideas of space once you have a unit of space, like a foot. But you can't form your original idea of a unit of space that way. Because there is no smallest piece that could serve as a unit. Okay. Um, no, you can so there has to be another way of forming a simple mode yes. from a simple idea. And presumably that's what he's calling variation here. And so how could that work? So I think the answer is that um, the simple idea of space, there is a simple idea of space, right? Let Locke lists it among simple ideas. There is a simple idea of space. But the simple idea of space is not the idea of the smallest space. It's just kind of like the idea of spaciness in general. And to form a simple mode of space, we have to limit that idea. Right? So we have to like combine that simple idea of space with the idea of specific limits. Now you might say, wait, doesn't that make it a mixed mode because it contains the idea of space and the idea of limits? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, and, um, do you remember when I wrote those ideas like being, well, I wrote not like, I wrote the ideas of being, unity, and power, and then I said, and maybe limit as ideas that come along with every other idea. This is basically, like this is a piece of evidence that limit belongs on this list. 
that, you know, so in other words, like the idea of a yard is an idea of three feet as one idea. Like every idea, it comes with units. I can't remember what. And similarly for three, you know, there's like, in addition to these three units, there's That's another unit. <laughs> right? Because there's a unity of the idea of three. Do you understand what I'm saying? What is that? Okay. We have one nod and everyone else. All right. <laughs> I guess I'll take that as yes. Um, so, um, yeah, so like, like, and similarly, of course, three is the, the You're good. Um, representation of something being three. Oh. Right? Like this idea, like every idea, comes along with being and unity and power. And so I think no that these. You couldn't um, even see that if you were in class. This it might explain, not. I don't think it works completely, but it I might mean, explain it why Locke says that the unit is the simplest idea. Because every other idea comes along with the idea of unity. Okay, well, right, so yeah. anyway, yes, yeah, so, so I think <laughs> like... Um, I oh, no. I thought that was just borrowing your car. Every idea always comes with limitation. And in particular, like when we perceive space, how, how do we get the simple idea of space? So this is the beginning of the chapter on space, book two, chapter 13, section two. We are gonna go on, you said go on. Page uh, 162. Going. Yeah, look at how silly he is. Um, I have showed above, and then it says chapter four, but it probably should say chapter five. But anyway, I've showed above that we get the idea of space, both by our sight and touch, which I think is so evident that it would be as needless to go to prove that men perceive by their sight a distance between bodies of different colors as that they see colors themselves. So we get the idea of we get the idea of space, the simple idea of space, by perceiving a distance between bodies. Yeah, it's just so the simple idea of space always comes. I was in traffic coming the other. I was behind a car like that. It was so stinky, and I yeah. was like dust around him. Uh, Sophia, yeah. you're not muted. It's well, I mean, so, okay, so first of all, that's not what the distinction between sensation and reflection, um, right, but reflection is supposed to be like sensation, but it's aimed at your own mind rather than an external thing. So, I mean, like what you're saying is something else that reflection could mean, like thinking it over or something like that, right? But it's, that's not what Locke means by reflection. Um, but I mean, I, I guess like you're saying something like, doesn't this involve an inference or... Um, um, but that's not what Locke says in that passage, right? He says that you per we perceive by sight a distance between bodies. Um, like the operation of sensation itself. And the, remember, this, this had better be true, right? Because the mind can't form new simple ideas by inference, according to Locke. We only get simple ideas by sensation or reflection. And again, reflection doesn't mean thinking it over or inferring. It means sensing the operations of your own mind. So Locke has to say that the simple idea of space is we get it by sensation. Is that, I mean, maybe you're saying you don't agree with Locke, which is, which is a whole different question. Right, but this is definitely what Locke is saying. 
We get the simple idea of space, and this is the type of situation where we get it. We perceive a distance between two bodies. So, like, we we get this distance in as a um, as one thing in sensation. We don't build it up out of little pieces. Yeah. So. Does that mean that space has the power to make us perceive the idea of space? So, I mean, that's that's actually a really good question. And I mean, and the answer, um, um, so this is a section I didn't assign. Maybe I should, where Locke talks about ideas of primitive qualities. Like suppose darkness is not in the object of in the external thing is nothing but the absence of light. Um, does that mean that our idea of darkness is just the absence of our idea of light? Or is our idea of darkness a positive thing just as much as our idea of light is? And Locke goes for the second alternative. So um, now, I mean, so can you say like, so, I mean, this, this distance here, if we're talking about vision, this distance here is basically a, a distance that's dark, right? Or at least we're not paying attention to whatever we say and see in here, right? So it might as well be dark. Um, so, um, and yet we get from it an idea, according to Locke. And this is, this is gonna be important because Hume is gonna go in a different direction and say that, that we don't have no idea of this distance. We only have the absence of an idea. And it's gonna, it, it leads to a completely different way of thinking about a vacuum or whatever. But for Locke, yeah, we get the simple idea of space by perceiving this, Nothing, <laughs> not perceiving, right? And so should you say that this space caused us to have the idea? Well, no, it's nothing. It can't cause anything, right? So, but, um, but these bodies, because of their configuration, cause us to have that idea of the distance between them, something like that. And, um, and in the case of touch, so Locke and Barclay, and, I mean, it's strangest in the case of Barclay, given his theory of vision, but Locke and Barclay and Hume um, mostly talk about things like this in terms of vision. I mean, in the place I was reading, Locke actually adds, oh, or we can do the same thing in the dark via touch or feeling. Um, Yes, maybe even all at the same time, you try to put your hand through here and it grows through in one place and it stops in the others. <laughs> um, although usually it seems to involve like moving your hand from one to the other. But anyway, um, uh, so they usually talk about these things in terms of vision and it's, it's easier to talk about it that way, at least for those of us who perceive. Um, but um, it's probably not really the main, the, the, the fundamental case. Um, probably the tangible primary qualities are the real tangible qualities. I don't, I don't remember if there's a place coming up, but, so I'll, I'll just say it now. I don't remember if there's a place coming up, I was planning to say that. that like, you know, uh, Locke says, one way you can tell that heat and cold are secondary qualities is that you can put both hands in the same water and one will feel hot and the other will feel cold. Like if they were like doing separate, different things before that, right? So whereas he says, you know, like the same thing will never both feel round and square. 
So that's like a difference in the primary and the secondary qualities. And, you know, and he, he does, there he's talking about your hands, right? Um, but Barclay, when he criticizes the primary secondary quality distinction is gonna say, well, wait, you know, the same thing can look round and square from different points of view. That's actually one of Descartes' examples in the meditations, in the sixth meditation, the towers that look a tower that looks round from far away and square from close up, or maybe it's the other way. I always forget. But right. So um, so actually, it seems like um, Locke Barclay is right, and Locke is right in that place to concentrate on the tangible, right? Like. I don't know if it's true, but it certainly seems more plausible that the same thing can't feel round and square at the same time. It might or not be true, but it's but but the thing with vision is definitely not true, right? Like everyone agrees that's not true. So anyway, um, that was just a digression, right? So that was a long way of saying that that. No, the space itself doesn't cause the um, simple idea of space, but the things that have the space between them cause the simple idea of space, I think, is what's going on here. Um, okay, uh, what was I going to say? Right, so that's actually what I was going to... That, that um, it's precisely because of that that we always get the simple idea of space with limits, right? If there were no bodies at all, then there's nothing to cause any idea. So we only get the simple idea of space from this situation perceiving a distance between two bodies. Um, and, you know, once we get the idea, so, so this is a simple mode of space. Um, that is, I mean, You might think this is weird and anomalous. Wait, why do we always get the simple mode of space with limits? But you know, you could ask the same thing about the simple mode of simple idea of unity. We always get it as the unity of something. We get it from sensation or reflection. It's always the unity of something that we sense or reflect on. Um, so um um, um, but so therefore we never just have the simple idea of space we always um, it, or at least initially we don't have the simple idea of space what we have is, is simple modes of space we can form the simple idea of space by itself by abstraction That's why I said the simple idea of space is like spaciness. It's like what all the spaces have in common. <laughs> sort of, not exactly, but anyway, something like that. So, um, and I think, yeah, let me read, this is chapter, book two, chapter 13. Section 13, where he says, um, um, page one sixty six. To divide and separate actually is, as I think, by removing the parts one from another, 
to make two superficies where before there was a continuity. And to divide mentally is to make in the mind two superficies where before there was a continuity and consider them as removed one from the other. Um, neither of which, but neither of these ways of separation, whether real or mental, is, as I think, compatible to pure space. Right? That is, um, this idea really is not composed of parts. It can't be divided into parts, even mentally. Because to divide something into parts mentally means to like imagine one part going away from the other. But there's nothing here. <laughs> so there's nothing that can go away from anything else. Um, so, um, so it's really completely different from the way we form the ideas of numbers initially. Then it's true, you can do something like this. Um, but at the bottom, there's always a unit that's not divisible. Now, it's not, it's not divisible. You might say, well, but I thought you said there was no small, small space. Doesn't that mean space is infinitely divisible? Well, I mean, what Locke actually says is that body is infinitely divisible. And that means there's no smallest space. But it doesn't mean space itself is infinitely divisible because space itself isn't divisible at all. You can't take the parts of it apart from each other. But if body is infinitely divisible, that means there's no smallest space, right? Because, um, like, um, no matter how small the body is, you can move two pieces of it away from each other, and then you get a space that's smaller than that body. I guess you probably don't want people to see it, right? But, like when you first start moving the two parts of the body apart from each other, this space is smaller than the space that the original body fit into. Does that, I mean, I don't know how to prove that. It's, it should be clear from the picture though, right? That like this space is, you know, like this was the starting body and now we've started to separate it. This, here is smaller than this. So no matter what body you take, you can always find a space that's smaller than that. But there's no small space, but it doesn't mean space is divisible. All right, if if you understand what I just said, ignore it, it's probably not that close. Um, all right, so, um, all right, there's more to say about, about space, but, um, but, um, I'm trying to follow the plan that perhaps led me to catching up last time I talked about this. <laughs> um, so, um, so are there are there questions about space? Because otherwise, I'm going to go on and talk about infinity. Yes. So that uh, you have to take a variation of space to get it to be uh, what whatever. Does that mean that that variation is putting into a the idea of a foot, the thing that means we can just split it up to smaller and smaller little bits. Uh, like, is that what the, vari the variation does to space? Is allow it to be chopped up? Well, no, I mean, well, uh, I don't think that's a. I mean, Okay, not in the sense that each individual variation is that, right? Because the very, so the idea that, like the idea of a foot is a variation of the simple idea of space, I think is the way he's putting it, right? So this is one variation of it. So like the, this variation of it is the one that puts it between limits, the kind we call a foot. Um, but maybe what you mean is, like, is the possibility of that variation? Yeah, something. Yeah, like yeah. I, I think that's right. Um, and how do we know that there's the possibility of that variation? 
Well, um, like, how do we know that every body, no matter how small, can be divided? Remember, he said that in in chapter four of book two about solidity. And he said, you know, we we find this to be the case in bodies that are large enough for us to actually feel them. And there he's talking about the tangible equality, right? Because it's solidity. So, um, and then he says, but the mind follows it also into ones that are too small to feel. So, um, we don't know it from experience. Because we have no experience of bodies that are too small to feel. Um, and so, like, I think that is, um, that's why I was saying that that thing that he only says explicitly in book four is already implicit here in book two. That, that there are certain necessary connections between ideas of primary qualities. That, that we don't, they, there are just visible necessary connections. We don't know them based on experience. Um, so, um, so that so we know that space is variable in this way because we know that bodies can always be divided from each other basically like that's what i was arguing trying to kind of argue up there with those pictures because we know that bodies can always be divided from each other we know that space can often is variable in this way so it's again it's so it's an example of what Kant would call synthetic a priori is it annoying that I keep talking about Kant? I mean, I know some people know something about Kant and others don't. Is it, is it okay? <laughs> um, it's better than when I talk about Hegel, which also will happen, but all right. Anyway, um, so, uh, right. So that was a good question. Um, but now I want to talk about infinity, which actually infinity involves uh, some similar problems. Um, well, in fact, one of the types types of ideas of infinity he, he says we have is the idea of infinite divisibility of the body. But um, so um, so first of all, and there's a lot to be said about it, but I'm going to try to say the absolute minimum <laughs> so I can get onto the new material. Um, so first of all, um, he starts with an important claim, which to us might seem obvious, which is that uh, finite and infinite are primarily types of quantity. Um, this is Book two, chapter 17, section one, on page 199. Finite and infinite seem to me to be looked upon by the mind as the modes of quantity and to be attributed primarily in their first designation only to those things which have parts and are capable of increase or diminution by the addition of sub or subtraction of any the least part. And such are the ideas of space, duration, and number, which we have considered in the foregoing chapters. So like I said, this might, maybe you can erase this. This might seem kind of obvious to us that um, finite and infinite are types of quantity. So the at least um, in their primary application, as he puts it. Um, so when you say something is infinite, like at least in the first place, you're talking about something being infinitely big or lasting infinitely long or being um, infinitely many. Um, um, uh, but this actually is uh, a direct challenge to Descartes' doctrine of the idea of the infinite. Um, um, like when God, when Descartes says, when God says that Descartes, no, when Descartes says <laughs> that, um, that God is 
the object of this idea we have called the idea of the infinite. Of course, he doesn't mean that there's infinitely many of God or that God is infinitely big. Um, I mean, I say, of course, I guess it should be obvious that Descartes couldn't mean that. Um, although someone might mean that, like Spinoza, <laughs> sort of. Well, but anyway, um, yeah, so that's not what Descartes means. He doesn't mean that God is infinitely big. He means that, like, um, God is beyond all limits. So Locke is in saying that that our idea of finite and infinite is primarily an idea of quantity. Um, Locke is um, going against that. And that's why right afterwards, in the bottom of the same paragraph, he starts talking about God all of a sudden. Right? Like, um, um, It is true that we cannot but be assured that the great God of whom and from whom are all things is incomprehensibly infinite. But yet, when we apply to that first and supreme being our idea of infinite, in our weak and narrow thoughts, we do it primarily in respect of his duration and ubiquity. And I think more figuratively to his power, wisdom, and goodness and other attributes which are properly inexhaustible and incomprehensible, etc. For when we call them infinite, we have no other idea of this infinity, but what carries with it some reflection on an intimation of that number or extent of the acts or objects of God's power, wisdom, etc. right? So um, Locke is saying that if we say, no, God is infinitely big, God is infinitely powerful, God is infinitely wise or whatever, Locke is saying that, first of all, when we call God infinite, the main thing we're saying is that God is infinitely big, <laughs> so to speak, that God is everywhere, right? Um, not by having different parts everywhere, though. So maybe that wouldn't be right to say God is infinitely big. But anyway, um, uh, but Locke says when we apply infinite to those other attributes, if we say God is infinitely powerful, what we mean is God has the power to do infinitely many things or something like that. Or to like move a body infinitely far or, you know, that type. So it all has to come down to quantity. So that's one challenge to Descartes' view. But the second challenge to the same doctrine, which is probably more important, is the question, how do we get the idea of the finite? So according to Descartes, and it's connected to the other disagreement or not, I don't know. But according to Descartes, to get the idea of the finite, you first have the idea of, have to have the idea of infinite and then restrict it. That's how the third meditation proof of the existence of God basically works. Like if you look at the summary that Descartes gives at the end of the third meditation, or in the beginning of the fourth meditation. I don't know. Anyway, if you look at Descartes' summary of that proof, the proof in the third meditation is very complicated, but then he basically summarizes it by saying that, like, I couldn't have the idea of myself as something finite if I didn't have the idea of something infinite, which I am, you know, um, which I am, so to speak, a limitation of. A limitation of its effects, anyway, something like that. So, um, um, so Locke says, what do you mean? There's no problem getting the idea of the finite. Um, and I think it's exactly the same thing that I was just talking about. This is chapter 17, um, section two. also on page 199, the obvious portions of extension that affect our senses carry with them into the mind the idea of finite. Right, so maybe I shouldn't have erased the old picture because it's the same picture has just come up again. 
How do we get the idea of the finite, that is of the limited? Well, some obvious portions of extension carry with them into the mind the idea of the finite. So every time we look at a finite body or a finite distance between bodies, we get the idea of limit, that is affinity. Um, so um, so this is good for an empiricist, right? Because if you say with Descartes that we first have to have the idea of the infinite, and then from that we can form the idea of the finite, we obviously didn't get the idea of the infinite from experience. At least that's the way Locke is thinking about it. I mean, the truth is, this simple idea of space, in a way, is an idea of infinite space. Right, I mean, I think that's kind of the way Kant is going to think about it, actually, in the transcendental aesthetic. Um, Kant, who otherwise is very close to Locke on these matters, but but Locke isn't thinking of it that way. So you know, because again, he's thinking it's because he's thinking of infinite as a mode of quantity. This is an idea of infinite space, not in the sense that it's an idea of infinitely much. Right, but rather in the idea that it's the idea of space without the limit. <laughs> so, um, right. So anyway, so so the way Locke is thinking about it, and you know, we couldn't get the idea of the infinite from experience, but we can obviously get the idea of the finite from experience. He says, and then the question is, how do we build up the idea of the infinite from the idea of the finite? Um, and there's a lot of weird things I would like to go into about his explanation and the sailor who can always put down more rope and whatever. It's really interesting, but all I'm going to say is the main point, which is his main point is that the idea of the infinite that we have is an idea of always more than whatever finite quantity you specify. So he calls it like a growing idea or something like that, right? Like we don't have an idea of what all the infinite things put together, how much that is. We don't have it. So one way he puts it is, we have an idea of the infinity of space, but not an idea of infinite space. Right, so the idea of the infinity of space is no matter how big a unit you choose and no matter how many times you multiply it, there's always more space. Whereas the idea of infinite space would be an idea of that, that's finished and you can't add anything else to it. Because it contains all of infinite space. And he says, we don't have an idea like that. In fact, an idea like that, in some sense, is a contradiction in terms, I think, is the way Locke thinks about it. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, he says that this thing about repeating, like I'm always adding one more thing, but how does that take us to? It seems like you have to start with an idea of infinity to allow that to equal infinity. You can always think of one more, but it seems like there's an extra idea in there like that is you know there's one more but and i can always add one more but it doesn't seem like that equates to well i think you're agreeing with him basically right he's saying the only kind of idea of infinity we have is that you're going to always add more one more okay. we don't have an idea of there's no concept that so, above that yeah we don't have an idea of finishing at, you know adding all of those one more because that would be an idea of something finite. It's finished. I mean, I mean, those are the same words, right? Like finished and finite. So, uh, um, right. So we can never say how much the infinite is. It is not an amount. It's like a a process. You know. So I mean. Um, 
again, I could try to talk about the relationship between this and modern set theory and whatever, but I will not. <laughs> I'm going to go on to, to the new material. Unless, are there more questions about the infinite before I go on? Infinitely many more questions. <laughs> All right. So, because um, now I'm going to go on to talk about relations. About that. I would say that. All right. Right, so um, so okay, and remember, relations are another kind of complex idea. Um, but uh, here, like, these are actually kind of, it, it might make sense to put these two together and have this off to the side because this, you know, uses a quite different ability of the mind than these do. Um, the ability is... This is the way Locke describes it. This is book two, chapter 25, section one on page 288. Um, the understanding and the consideration of anything is not confined to that precise object. It can carry any idea, as it were, beyond itself, or at least look beyond it to see how it stands in conformity to any other. So this is not really formed by putting simple ideas together somehow. It's, we start with an idea, and it doesn't have to be a simple idea, although, of course, it's composed of simple ideas. It's complex. The mind is considering this idea, but then and he gives two alternatives, which I'm not sure what the difference between them is supposed to be. Uh, but it seems like there is a difference because of that at least, <laughs> right? It can do one or at least it can do the other. So that means they're not synonymous, I guess. But anyway, um, <laughs> either it can carry this idea beyond itself, or it can look beyond it to something else. Anyway, you know, one way or another, the point is that while it's it's considering this one idea, it somehow brings another idea into, well, relation. <laughs> I mean, um, it does it either by kind of bringing this idea up to this one or kind of like looking through this idea towards this one or I mean yet those are obviously metaphors and I don't know what the difference between the those metaphors is supposed to be. That's how relation is supposed to work. Well, I mean that that is it's based on that ability of the mind that we're able to form ideas of relation. So you know that is once having done that, we we form a new idea, which kind of um, consists of the. How can you say this without ever using the word relation? <laughs> right. So we form a new idea that consists of that um, respect in that kind of direction in which you can look beyond this idea towards this one. And that's the idea of the relation. So, like, I mean, you know, for example, if you have the idea of, um, you have the idea of a tree, and then you have the idea of a huge mountain, and you're considering this idea, but then you kind of look beyond this idea to this idea. 
And um, at least, I mean, there may be more of one way of doing this, which I'm not sure how Locke explains that. But anyway, at least one way of doing it is you look beyond this idea towards this one and you um, see that to do that, you have to look from a small size to a big size. And from that, you form the idea of the relation bigger than or smaller than. I'm not sure. Well, maybe anyway, one of those. <laughs> uh, so, um, Um, so it follows from this explanation of what a relation is, that a relation is always between two things, right? I mean, this is how you form the idea of a relation. You start with one idea and you look towards another one. And that's actually the title of book two, chapter 25, section six. Um, relation only betwixt two things. <laughs> so this is going to cause a problem for the relation that Locke devotes an entire chapter to, the relation of identity. Because, and I think I said this before, but I'll, I can't say it too often, that identity means sameness, right? That the relation of sameness. Um, so, I mean, this is a relation that uh, things are supposed to bear to themselves. Nothing is the same as some other. <laughs> Everything is the same as itself. So there's only one thing. Where are the two things? <laughs> um, I mean, does the understanding somehow look beyond this idea back to this idea? So, um, according to Hegel, I know I threatened I was mentioning Hegel and I will. <laughs> according to Hegel, the answer is yes. Hey, so, and, uh, by the way, so what is the opposite of relative? I mean, Locke uses two terms here. One is a little weird, although he's not the only one who does this. He contrasts relative to positive. Right, so like, uh, so like these like these would be positive ideas as opposed to these which are relative ideas. Um, but the other, which is the better opposite of relative, is absolute. Locke also uses that. So like absolute means not relative. That's what it should be anyway. So, um, so Hegel's view is that the non-relative or absolute consists of the like simple, like going out of itself and being reflected back into itself. Um, for people who also heard in 112, you remember I was talking about the a version of this in Emerson. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so that's Hegel's solution to this problem. I could try to talk about Frege's solution, or I don't know. But anyway, neither of those, that's not Locke's solution, right? Locke thinks it doesn't make sense to talk about being carried out of yourself back into yourself. I mean, I guess, like, in a way, Hegel agrees that it doesn't make sense in that Hegel thinks we have to rework logic because of this, <laughs> right? So, like, but anyway, so Locke is not doing anything like that. So, how does he solve this problem? Um, and 
he starts his discussion of identity. This is chapter 17, section one. Another occasion the mind often takes of comparing is the very being of things when considering anything as, as existing at any determined time and place, we compare it with itself existing at another time and thereon form the ideas of identity and diversity. Right, so the solution is, how is it that, there, that there's in a way is only one thing and in a way are two things? Like, if this is the time axis and this is the space axis. So, like the relation of identity is always going between things like this. It's a relation of the thing to itself at another time. Right? So that's why, in a way, there's only one thing, because this is at this time, what, you know, what's here at this time is what was here at this time. But in a way it's two things because they're not the same. This one's at this time and this one's at that time. Um, So as long as we remain, now I think Locke isn't completely careful about this, but I think this is official, this is what he officially says, therefore, that like as long as we stay at one place in time, there really isn't a question of identity. Like the idea we get from that is the idea of unity, not the idea of identity. The idea of unity is an absolute idea, it's not relative. Um, Um, but nevertheless, it's the um, the foundation of identity is the role role of time and space in individuating things. Um, it's um, the reason you can ask: Is this the is, is what's here now the same as what was here at this other time? Is that um, nothing can be in two places at the same time. Like, for example, the body of Christ can't be in two places at the same time. Um, right, so um, this is also in that, this is actually the sentence after the one I just read. When we see anything to be in any place in any instant of time, we are sure be it what it will, that it is that very thing and not another which at that same time exists in another place. How like and undistinguishable soever it may be in all other respects. Right, so like if there's something here at this time, it can't be the same as something that's somewhere else at that time. And because of that, we can ask if this thing, is it this one or is it this one? That's what we're always asking when we ask about identity. Like, is the thing that's here now, where was it at this time? Was it here or was it there? Um, but of course, also gets him, lets him get in that dig against transubstantiation. Um, So, wait, what was that Okay, so my hope is, I'm not sure, I'll, this might be something I have to put over to next time, and that might not be bad, but um, um, 
So like the main case of identity that Locke discusses, the one he's most interested in is personal identity. And I guess like to understand that, um, what, like what kind of question that is, you have to look back at this and say, okay, how do we decide whether this was the same as this? Um, and, you know, like, I think Locke's position is that, of course, really, these two are never the same, because this is at this time, and this is at that time. The same thing, you know, it can't be both at one time and at the other. That's a contradiction. So these really are different. I think that's his position. And as we'll see, that if that's true, that makes his view kind of like the opposite of what Hume says about this. I think the exact opposite in a weird way. So these things really are different, but um, we count them as the same for some purpose, basically. And depending on the, what the purpose is, what gets counted as the same here is going to be different. So like. Like, for example, suppose here we have this little oak sapling. And this little oak sapling is made out of lots of little pieces of matter. And suppose these little pieces of matter that were in the oak sapling at this later time are scattered all over the place. But meanwhile, there's this huge oak tree. <laughs> so, and well, I guess I shouldn't draw it moving because trees don't usually move, but <laughs> it should be at the same place. But anyway, you get the idea. So at this time, there's this huge oak tree. So like, what is the same as this oak sapling? Is it these scattered pieces of matter that were once parts of this oak sapling? Or is it this oak tree, which, um, obviously doesn't consist of the same pieces of matter as the original one. I mean, for one thing, it's much bigger, so like it has to have other matter, but in the way living things um, operate, probably a lot of pieces of matter have, like as I've in this drawing, have like scattered and they've been replaced by other ones as the oak grows. Um, so which is the same? And Locke said, I think Locke's answer is, well, on the one hand, strictly speaking, neither of them is the same. This was an oak sapling at this time, and these are things at some other time. <laughs> but for one purpose, like if you ask, is this the same, what is the same mass of matter at this time as this was at this time? The answer would be those scattered things. But if you ask, what's the same oak tree? The answer would be this. So like we have different ways of establishing this relation of identity, depending on what we're talking about. Um, and then the question is going to be, okay, how do we establish the identity in the case of persons? Um, now, the reason I said it might not be bad if I don't get to talk about that is because uh, there's a whole like, um, thing to talk about involving the basis of Locke's morality as he works it out in this book. And personal identity is one part of it. Another part of it is the moral relations. And another part of it is this discussion of free will. So like, I'm going to talk about all those together at the end if I have time, or if not, then at the beginning next time. So for now, I'm going to go on from so leave this over unfinished business. What is the relation of identity between persons? And um, I guess I'm going to skip this. And just talk about substances and mixed modes. Are there questions about relations in general or the relation of identity in particular?
Um, I mean, okay, yeah, no, I won't talk about that. I'm going to talk about ideas of substances and ideas of mixed modes. So, um, so again, in the case of um, the difference between these is not supposed to be uh, in the type of ideas that make them up. It's in the way the ideas are referred to an external object. Now, um, I think, um, so like I said, one way of understanding that difference, um, but I think Locke himself thinks that this is like an obscure way of understanding it, is to say here, in this case, we have just a bunch of ideas put together, and that's a mixed mode. But here we have a bunch of ideas put together. Um, and so, I mean, okay, I guess I can take a step back, right? The ideas are ideas of qualities in the external object. So the ideas of the power to cause those ideas. <laughs> um, but here we just take them as the idea of these powers, whereas here we take them as the ideas of these powers in a subject. And the subject they're in is the substance, the substance that has the powers. Um, So that's also why he says that um, that ideas of modes are ideas of well, that's confusing. He says they're ideas of, of what people used to call accidents. That's ignoring the distinction between essential properties and accidents. Yeah, let me not get to that right now. So, um, but anyway, the, the point is the modes are supposed to be in here in something as their subject, and that thing is the, is the substance. Um, okay, but what is this relation of inhering? And what is a substance? Like, so this it's a kind of substance that has these qualities, right? So like that, I, so an example of an idea of substance would be the idea of a horse. So um, this is the idea of a horse. Um, so it, that is, it's, this is a general idea of substance. So it's the idea of a kind of substance. What kind of substance? The kind that has the qualities that cause um, all the parts of this complex idea. So, um, what is substance in general, Locke asked? Right, it seems like we have to know that because we're saying I have the idea of the kind of substance that has these qualities. But on the other hand, um, to get the idea of substance in general, I have to take away all the qualities. So what am I thinking of? And Locke says something I know not what. <laughs> Right, there's he can you know he compares it to the story of this supposed Indian. I'm not even sure. I think this means from India, not American, but 
because yeah, I'm not sure he even used he usually calls Native Americans Americans. Um so, but in any case, this supposed Indian who was who was asked, like, who said that the world is held up on the back of an elephant, and then they asked, well, what is the elephant standing on? And he says, oh, it's on a giant tortoise. And they asked him, well, what is the tortoise standing on? And he says something, I know not what. <laughs> right? So Locke says it's the same thing here. It's like, if you ask, you know, what is the quality of color in? You'll answer, well, it's in an extended body or something like that. And they ask, well, what is extension and surface and all those other things in? And now you have to say something, I know not what. <laughs> so, I mean, the point, the, the point of this all being that, and this is why I say that maybe this is an obscure way of understanding the difference, that if you think that we get this difference by having a really clear idea of what it is to be a substance and like have things in here or in you or in it, or whatever, I mean, uh, um, then, uh, and then we take that idea of a substance and we add some other ideas to it to get an idea of a particular kind of substance. That doesn't seem to be right because the idea of substance in general, we don't understand. Um, so instead, when Locke explains the uh, how we actually form these ideas of kinds of substance, he talks about um, constant conjunction, as Hume would say. This is in Book 2, Chapter 23, Section 1 on page 268. Um, the mind takes notice that a certain number of these simple ideas go constantly together. Um, and then uh, a little bit farther down, not imagining how these simple ideas can subsist by themselves, we accustom ourselves to suppose some substratum wherein they do subsist and from which they do result, which therefore we call substance. So the way we form these ideas of substance is that we find certain simple ideas constantly occurring together. Um, and um, we think that uh, there must be one thing that causes all of them, and that's why they always come together. Um, and so we suppose, which, you know, like also has the sub in it, right? Then it changes to P because of the, we suppose something, some substratum, <laughs> Um, that is like the the external unity of these different qualities. Right? When I say the external unity is important, like they don't come together because I want them together. I didn't put them together. And yet they always keep coming together. So I assume that there's some one principle, some like some, so to speak, like point of unity from which they all come, and it's outside me. And that's where I get the idea of substance. Um, 
Um, by the way, this etymology I mean, uh, no, I probably should have something. All right. I mean, I'll just say like Locke should probably know this, but I guess he doesn't. A lot of people don't seem to know it. The, the, you know, I mean, the distinction between substance and accident was first made in Greek, obviously, not in Latin, right? It's Aristotle's terminology. And this Latin word, substantia, was introduced to translate a Greek word, usia. And usia doesn't mean such like standing other, under or anything like that. Um, usia is like a form of the verb to be. In fact, it's the exact same word that was also translated as Latin as essentia. Essence. That's Aristotle's word for substance. So when people say that the like that based on this word having the Latin word having the sub in it, that the idea of substance was originally of something under, then uh, that's a little bit of a mistake. I mean, it is connected to under because Aristotle says that it's always the subject, the hypo kamenon, right? So that has hypo, which is under. <laughs> um, but the word substance in Greek itself is not. All right, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Right? <laughs> um, all right, so anyway, um, and in Arabic also, the word for substance is. Uh, Joha. It doesn't know under. All right. So um, um, so as opposed to what's the difference between with a mixed mode? Um, um This is book two, chapter 22, section one on page 262. Um, these mixed modes being also such combinations of real, of simple ideas as are not looked upon to be characteristical marks of any real beings that have a steady existence, but scattered in independent ideas put together by the mind are thereby distinguished from the complex ideas of substances, right? So like the key difference between, between ideas of substance and ideas of mixed modes is that here, I, like, I attribute the unity of the idea to something outside myself. Because the ideas came together. They keep coming together. Whereas here, I mean, so in this case, it could be that I've often seen these ideas together, right? Like in the case of drunkenness, you may have often seen people who are drunk, but um, you could form the idea of drunkenness if you never, if you understand the simple ideas that it's made of. And so, um, and so the difference is when I form the idea of a mode, I attribute the unity of the idea to myself. I may have often seen them together, but that's not why I'm putting them together. I'm putting them together for my own purpose. And they would go together in, in my idea, even if they never went together in reality. Um, And so remember when I said before that I think I said this last time that that is yesterday <laughs> that um, uh, that even though in principle you can have the same group of simple ideas, one of them as a mixed mode, the other as I and, I mean sorry you can have the same group as a mixed mode and as the idea of a substance um, in real life it's usually 
uh, you can tell from Locke's examples that there, maybe, I, did I say this today? <laughs> maybe it's today. Anyway, in real life, you can tell from Locke's examples that, uh, that we tend to use these two different ideas for different purposes. So like the examples of ideas of substance are, are um, mostly natural things like horses or gold, or, you know, that's the type of example to give of ideas of substance. The ideas of mixed modes that Locke discusses are mostly um, have some kind of moral um, or political use. Um, um, and, you know, you can see why, because the point is, like, if you're considering a natural thing as a natural thing, you want to know how the, I, how the qualities actually go together because of the object. But if you're discussing morality or politics, what you want to know is how the ideas should go together, whether they actually go together or not. And I mean, Locke actually uses that as um, um, as part of explaining what mixed modes are. Um, you know, and, and how they're related to or not related to what we've actually seen together. He says, it's evident that the early stage of society, when people were inventing institutions that had never yet existed, they must have had the idea before the thing. Right, so it's that type of case where we need to, to form mixed modes. Um, Right, so like here's examples of mixed modes that Locke gives. Obligation, drunkenness, a lie, hypocrisy, sacrilege, murder. <laughs> right, whereas the example I give of substance are like horse, gold, whatever, yeah. Um, once those ideas become common, do they become substances? Like if we keep them around for long enough, do they start to... Um, I guess, like, can we make some political formation real enough that it has the substance even if it didn't fall it? That's a good question. I mean, I think some people might think of it that way. I don't think Locke does. Um, um, or at least he thinks we shouldn't do that. Right. I mean, you can also ask this about artificial things like art. And sometimes he gives artificial things as examples of, of well, actually, I mean, I think he says most artificial things are collective ideas of substances. It's like the idea of a herd of sheep or something. So, right. Because they're put together out of parts. Um, but um, but uh, sometimes I mean, because like here's the thing, an artificial thing, you could say the same thing about. Don't you have to have the idea before the thing exists? Like the first person to make it had to have the idea before they made it. Oops, I see that I'm out of time. So um, uh, I guess, yeah, so I think the point is Locke thinks that if we get to the point of, of forming an idea of substance of a like a political configuration or something like that, then we're forgetting that it's something that we make. <laughs> and that would be a mistake. All right, on that note, um, I will see you Thursday.